So the phrase I want to talk about today, think about, reflect on, invite you and me to seek to live out, is the phrase theory of change. This gets talked about a lot in our day for businesses, for not-for-profits, for government agencies, particularly for people who are working on some kind of social change. The idea is you don't want to just take random shots in the dark. You want to have a theory of change. You start with a desired outcome. What's the great end goal that you are pursuing? And then you look at what are the uh, outcomes that need to be arranged between where I am right now, you kind of work backwards, and where it is that you want to go. And what are the rationales for each one of the outcomes in that link? Why, why does it rationally, coherently fit together? What's the theory of change? Apparently, it dates back to Peter Drucker, brilliant guru of leadership and management thought. Uh, who talked about management by objectives. And then in the 1990s, Carol Weiss and other folks at the Aspen Institute. By the way, how come we never get invited to the Aspen Institute? There should be some kind of a become new.me institute in Aspen, I think. Anyway, uh, they talked about it quite a lot. And that the measure of a great theory of change is looking at three different facets. One is the impact. The impact is uh, the power that it has on the individual life upon which it is focused, and then influence, that is, does it cause change in other people who are working in that same field, and then leverage, does it motivate people to want to give, to invest resources to be a part of this? And you could look at any kind of system that you want to. You could look at something like uh, climate change or helping the people to be healthier or stop racism or combat poverty. And the question is, what is the theory of change behind your efforts? There's a um, cartoon in explaining this. It shows these two kind of nebbish looking professors standing in front of a blackboard. And there's some incredibly complicated mathematical formula with all sorts of exotic symbols. And then there's the phrase, and here a miracle occurs. And then there's another set of extremely complicated formulas. And the first professor is saying to the second professor, I think you should be a little more explicit about step number two, because and here a miracle occurs is not quite a theory of change. Now it turns out that all kinds of movements have them. Henry Ford had the idea that one day our nation could be filled with people who all own their own car. And so, refining the idea of the assembly line and then paying the kind of wages where everybody who worked on a car would be able to afford a car, to buy a car. Or Steve Jobs, the idea that there could be um, technology that would be so compelling and so beautiful. And so he thought through each stage to think different. And the marvel of elegance of design and tremendous technology and the simplicity of a thousand songs in your pocket. You might have noticed that the iPod just got discontinued after I think something like 22 years. In the field of psychology, how is it that people change? Was marked by theories of change. So Freud came along and said, our problem is we have these unsatisfied, largely unconscious drives and desires. And if people could just achieve insight, if through techniques like psychoanalysis, like free association, people could become aware of what they had been repressing, now they could change. B.F. Skinner came along and said, no, you don't need to worry about any of that. It's all about reward, just reinforcement and punishment. So whatever it is that you want to achieve, you just reinforce that, shape the reinforcement, and you'll get there. Carl Rogers came along and said, no, it's about the human potential that lies latent within each one of us. And if we could just experience unconditional acceptance and warm positive regard, it would blossom like a flower. In the 20th century, I think you could make an argument that one of the great, most influential theories of change was actually the 12 steps. People trapped in alcoholism 
or later on other forms of addiction, how are you going to change? Well, nagging people didn't seem to work. Just pain didn't seem to work. Going into a hospital didn't seem to work. Trying harder didn't seem to work. So admit, I, I got this problem before which I am powerless and my life has become unmanageable. And then the next step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And then the next step, seeing so the theories of, of change, there's a series of steps that are logically coherently related to each other. Made the decision, I would turn my life and my will over to the care of God. I can't, he can, I think I'll let him. Now that brings us to the big question. If you were to look throughout human history, all the geniuses, all the governments, all the movements, all the businesses, all the economies that have ever existed, and you were to ask yourself the question, what is the most influential theory of change of all time in any sphere, what would it be? And I will tell you, simply as a matter of history, whether you agree with it or not, whether you think that it is wise or foolish, beneficial or destructive, nothing else comes close. One day, a carpenter who was said to have been crucified, failed, humiliated, and then resurrected, stood with a group of 11 people that nobody in their right mind would ever have selected. Fisherman, tax collector, political activist, zealot. And here's what he said. Here's the theory of change. All authority has been given to me. So now you go, as you're traveling all around the world, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you, and I will be with you. And that movement uh, is unprecedented. Its impact was so strong that billions of people have had their lives changed by it. Its influence was so great that it caused the founding of places like Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and the Red Cross and Compassion International and hospitals and uh, untold institutions. Uh, its motivation to uh, stimulate generosity, to cause people to give, uh, is measureless and, and nothing else is anywhere in the vicinity. All that brings me to page 240 in Dallas's book, The Renovation of the Heart. You see, the renovation of the heart really is about this theory of change, the one theory of change that really, really matters. Dallas writes, let us simply focus upon the application of Matthew 28, 18 through 20, verses 18 through 20. This is God's plan for the growth and prospering of local congregations, as well as the church at large, as well as the world. It is his plan for spiritual formation in the human community. Number one, we make apprentices of Jesus. It is these of which the local congregation of the called out ones are to consist. The New Testament does not recognize a category of Christians who are not apprentices of Jesus in kingdom living now. Although clearly it does recognize baby apprentices who are still mostly preoccupied with and dependent upon natural human abilities. And then secondly, in the theory of change, immerse these apprentices at all levels of growth in the Trinitarian presence. We'll talk about this more in coming days. Jesus says to baptize them in the name. And the idea here is not just put water on them. To baptize meant to immerse, to plunge into the presence of something. And we are to be plunged into the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then uh, teaching them that is transforming the apprentices inwardly in such a way that doing the words and deeds of Jesus is not the focus, but the natural outcome or side effect of transformation. This is what teaching them to do everything I have commanded you amounts to. That is the greatest theory of change in the history of the world as a matter of simple fact. And that's the invitation to today. Where would you like to change? Take a moment now and just reaffirm I am a follower of Jesus. My ultimate goal this day 
is to be with him, to learn from him how to be like him. And I can do that in each moment. And then be immersed this day in the Trinitarian presence. Right now, in the beauty of this moment, many of you say you kind of enjoy it when a car goes by or um, a dog barks or something happens to distract. Nothing's happening right now. God's just allowing the beauty of this moment uh, to wash over me, to wash over us. And then learn from him to be transformed from within so that thoughts and feelings and perceptions and words and acts of love, love above all, love above all, and joy and peace come flowing. Many, many people uh, walk through life in their souls, in their marriages, in their family, and their work, and it's just kind of drift, and there is no simple, effective theory of change. Who would have guessed 2,000 years ago, a carpenter from Galilee would come up with the one that is still spreading? That's the invitation for today. That is what we as individuals and churches are called to do. Guard your heart. See you next time.